Peter, you are one of the main organizers of the conference. Could you tell us a few words uh, how it all came about? Well, um, uh, in fact, the idea started um, when a couple of years ago, the Ecumenical Patriarch uh, uh, actually um, uh, repeated a couple of times that he wanted to inter intensify the efforts towards organizing such a pan-Orthodox council. And he even mentioned concrete dates, the concrete dates of 2012 and 2013. Of course, we knew about um, the mentioning of such dates before and that it could uh, be possible that uh, the deadline was not um, uh, actually reached. But still, we, we then wanted to, be, to play a bit safe and to organize this event in the autumn of 2012 so as to be actually, uh, uh, hopefully, um, in time, uh, a couple of months before the actual uh, pan Orthodox Council would, would, uh, would be organized. Of course, um, we, we also realized that in case there would be further difficulties and the Council itself would, would have to be postponed once again, that would be a, 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 a thing of major importance to organize an academic conference dealing with the main themes of the pan Orthodox Council, which have been um, uh, agreed upon uh, already several decades uh, ago. Now, last week, when the conference itself took place, for me it was a, a new thing to learn that uh, actually the preparation of this pan Orthodox Council till now only has been, in a way, the, the, um, uh, the subject of reflections on the official level of the Orthodox Church. So it was the initiative taken by the Ecumenical Patriarch uh, and, 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 and his team. But as such, that the academic world till now has not even not, not been invited to, to, to reflect together with, with, uh, with the Orthodox Church uh, in, uh, to, to take steps in preparation of the Council and therefore our initiative, our, uh, the, the conference which we, which we have organized um, was experienced certainly by the theologians of the Orthodox Church as an important device to, to make also the people of God, the Orthodox people of God, much more aware of the significance of um, the, the upcoming Pan-Orthodox Council. Do you think that um the objectives and expectations of the organizers hit home with this conference. I want to say that, uh, as a whole, we are we are very pleased. Um, of course, um, uh, right from the very beginning, we found it important to um, to involve um, a plurality of opinions and um, and uh, with and also of, of orthodox voices. Uh, on, on the teams of the of the council, so we we took the initiative to regroup the ten teams on the agenda of the council into five sessions because this was the only way in which it would have been workable huh? and, uh, and and organizable, and we we found extremely important to organize each time two orthodox speakers coming from different um, uh, uh, jurisdictions they were not invited as spokespersons of these jurisdictions, and, uh, but actually they were um, orthodox theologians uh, who, on the basis of their um, academic output, have been selected by us as to be important uh, uh, academics who, who really have to make an important input um, uh, with, with regard to, to the, the topics at hand. Mm -hmm. And I must say that, by and large, um, um, I, I, I believe that um, uh, this, the, the fact that we were able to invite both uh, each time two Orthodox scholars uh, with a, a meaningful message, and at times it could be a message which was quite critical towards um, the, the, for example, the role of the Orthodox Church um, uh, or the uh, uh, two firm uh, church-state relationships uh, or the um, co-responsibility of the Orthodox Church um, in some of the uh, ethical problems in society, and I'm uh, thinking here of the Romanian Orthodox theologian Radu Preda, for example, uh, 
Um, I, I, I believe that their input was, was, um, was uh, really, in most cases, uh, extremely well prepared and it was a, a, a meaningful event. So we took the decision each time to invite um, one um, Roman Catholic or Protestant theologian uh, to also shed light on the same issue from another um, church perspective. And I, I believe that, that um, this decision made each of the, of the five sessions uh, actually um, uh, gave the very, very rich uh, uh, content. You gave yourself a brilliant presentation at this conference. Could you shortly give us a summary of what you have said? Yeah. Uh, so we we um, uh, we found it very important um, as from the moment of organizing this conference um, to situate this conference um, at a moment in which my own church, being the Roman Catholic Church, um, commemorates the 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council. And we believe that the success of this council um, really was, um, uh, 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 was uh, made possible very much due to the prophetic decision of the Pope who convened this council, Pope John XXIII, to invite observers from other Christian churches to participate uh, really in an active way to the organization of the Second Vatican Council. And of course at that moment the Catholic Church wasn't engaged into a very active ecumenical dialogue with the other churches. So at the same time it was an, uh, an opportunity for Roman Catholics to, to learn, to come to know and, and appreciate uh, um, um, uh, theologians uh, from the other uh, Christian churches. One deliberately wanted to invite theologians who already had some ec ecumenical experience, for example, within the World Council of Churches, and not so much official church representatives like bishops. And um, one, one actually has given them a place of honor within the St. Peter's Basilica during the public events and, and, and all of the sessions. But their role has been extremely important, um, uh, especially in uh, initiatives which have been particularly organized for them in which they had the occasion to reflect on the texts which were being developed uh, at the very, very moment uh, and being discussed uh, publicly in, uh, in, in the St. Peter's uh, Basilica where they didn't have the opportunity and freedom to, 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 to raise their voices directly. Huh? But in fact, no, non, uh, nothing of the entire material was being hidden from them. Huh? So they had access to the, to the latest texts under discussion. And every week, the, uh, the Secretariat for Christian Unity, which had been given the task uh, to, to, to make their stay uh, um, a very cordial one and a very warm one, uh, and the, the Secretariat for Christian Unity invited actually the observers to come and meet every week during the two and a half, three months during which the council convened. And at that moment, they were discussing the same text which were under debate uh, at, at the council itself. And, <coughs> excuse me, I have been, been able uh, during this conference to reconstruct, in a way, the highlights of the presence of the observers from the very beginning of the council till the very end. And at the very end, of course, uh, there was, for example, the, the, uh, the unforgettable uh, liturgy of the word, uh, which for the first time was organized uh, in the presence of the Pope uh, uh, at St. Paul's uh, outside the walls in, in Rome, an event which uh, takes place every year at the end of the so-called week of prayer for Christian unity, uh, um, the week uh, in between 18 and 25 of January and which is still this very moment uh, uh, um, uh, being organized in the, in the presence of the Pope uh, and, and, and with, with the uh, uh, explicit uh, approval of, of, of the Pope. Uh, um, so uh, this was in a way the first uh, common non-Eucharistic liturgy uh, uh, which was being organized at the, at the highest level. Uh, but um, um, apart from, from that general overview, I, always, I also um, uh, paid attention to two extremely important documents for the Roman Catholic Church. The first one it actually has received the epitome dogmatic constitution. It is uh, actually our, um, uh, the most official document on the understanding of the church on ecclesiological matters um, uh, from the Roman Catholic Church till this very moment, because also for us, of course, the council is the, the highest expression of, of church doctrine. 
And at the same time, of course, the Second Vatican Council produced a very fine document in which the, 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 uh, the Catholic Church explained its own convictions with regard to the ecumenical movement. It's called the decree on ecumenism. Now, these two documents were promulgated officially during the third year of the Council in 1964. But during the first year during which the Council met, of course, of, uh, officials within the Catholic Church, called the Roman Curia, had prepared its own first documents. Uh, it's, but that document still reflected very much a kind of pre-conciliar uh, neo-scholastic conviction. So this document, both documents were actually put away from the table during the first year of the Council. So the second year was an extremely important year. In between the first and second year, new drafts had been prepared, which reflect a, a much more ecumenical openness. And so when, in this, during the second year, the observers formulated their own reactions to these texts, then these, these reactions um, were extremely important. And, and they, they, they wanted <coughs> even to ameliorate this text. Um, and we can, we can prove now, because we have here in Leuven um, and also in Louvain-la-Neuve, um, uh, actually in the archives of some of the um, uh, uh, bishops and theologians present at the Second Vatican Council, the, the literal text of the report of these observers. So on the basis of these texts, these texts we were able to show that the observers were able to have an, an, an influence, so some people say even more than ordinary bishops, to some of the final um, um, uh, uh, phrases of the document. Peter, uh, the results uh, of the Vatican II for the Orthodox Church were incredible. The uh, uh, elevation of the anathema, the uh, recognition of the sacraments of the Orthodox Church. We, we couldn't have even expected uh, those things. Uh, do you think that the Orthodox observers really influenced those decisions? And if so, who would have it been in the in the among the delegates? <coughs> well, I, 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 I believe on the basis, for example, of these, um, um, uh, of these reports, of these weekly meetings, um, uh, uh, there you can, you can really uh, sense uh, that um, uh, several uh, groups of observers have been um, uh, very active. The of the World Council of Churches, in fact, in 1961, during the Third Assembly, the Orthodox were uh, particip participating uh, for the first time. Uh, so for that reason, also the World Council of Churches had delegated two important theologians. The one um, was um, um, a theological secretary, Lucas Fischer, and the other was um, the um, Greek Orthodox theologian, Nikos Nisiotis. And so um, uh, apparently, uh, or especially um, Nikos Nisiotis was extremely engaged in, um, uh, in studying the documents and in writing important um, uh, observations on what happened uh, 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 during the, the Council and therefore um, uh, had a, uh, an important influence uh, actually on, on, um, uh, on, on the outcomes. Apart from that, of course, I have to mention uh, one, 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 one other um, uh, theologian uh, 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 actually uh, who, who, who wasn't um, uh, himself present at the Council, but whose works had been um, studied uh, intensively and, and have undergone um, a, a tremendous influence. I'm referring here uh, to uh, the Russian Orthodox theologian Nicholas Afanasyev, who, um, um, uh, who was part of the, um, um, uh, of the Orthodox diaspora. Yeah? Um, uh, towards um, uh, France and, and who was uh, a theologian uh, teaching uh, at the Institut Saint-Serge where, where we actually gathered. Uh, as, as many people know, uh, he, his, um, um, he, he had uh, in, in these years already published uh, some, some major articles, usually in, in the periodical Irenicon, which was published uh, by the monks of Cheftonje here in, in, in Belgium. And um, a few years before the start of the Council, Afanasyev has published um, an, an article um, uh, in which he um, uh, actually pleaded to 
not to emphasize the universal church um, to a, a too great extent, but rather to, um, um, to, uh, to develop a kind of Eucharistic ecclesiology starting from the local church. And this idea, this, this prophetic essay, uh, is the only um, uh, article and text by a non-Catholic theologian which has been cited officially in the footnotes of, um, 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 uh, of, an, of important of, of, of the conciliar documents. And, and so in, in, in so doing, it's clear that, that, that he is really, uh, um, that uh, it's, a, it's an evidence that he, that he really uh, has exercised a tremendous influence on, on the council. Uh, Peter, do you think, do you believe uh, if the, when this pan-Orthodox council takes place and if the uh, Catholic or non-Orthodox observers are invited, uh, could they r have a real influence on the decisions of the council and what kind of uh, influence, positive input of such observer team could be? Last week, among others, Michel Stavrou clearly said that um, uh, uh, many more topics need to be discussed. So the water between Catholics and Orthodox maybe still is quite deep. And we hope that the conference of last week uh, contributed to, to discussing these issues in a very realistic level and not so much maybe over optimistic level. Still, I believe that, and I hope, that um, uh, actually the, the, um, um, uh, that during such a council, uh, that uh, actually also Roman Catholic and uh, observers and observers from the other Christian churches will be invited to um, play a kind of similar role as the observers during the Second Vatican Council.